Okay, we're ready to get started. Sean, maybe go on awful loud. Sean, okay. Please come in and take your seats. I've lost your card. You gentlemen want to come in and introduce yourselves? I lost the card with your names on it, sorry. <laughs> Joining us to meet evening, actually leading us, or, is the voice inspiration. So, we They're are an acapella group going to lead the Star Spangled Band for us. Introduce yourselves and then everybody rise. So we are four of the men from a local chorus with a lot of local Arlington members. We're called vocal, sorry. Is this Michael? Does this help? Yeah. Um, anyway, we, go. we are four members of a local uh, chorus that meets in Lexington, because it was cheaper. And um, we sing uh, mostly barbershop. We're called Vocal Revolution. We have Francesco Logozo, Luis Ares, Al Rodrigo Alvarez, and I'm Mark Scholdenfry. And we have a job to do. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you. Can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming, whose broad stripes and bright stars to the perilous fight o'er the ramparts we watched. We're so gallantly streaming, and the rockets reclare the bombs bursting in air gave proof through the night that our flag was still there. Oh, say does that. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Good job. <laughs> do, we have, do we have any new town meeting members who have yet to be sworn in? If so, please rise. Please repeat after me, inserting your name. I will participate fully and will fairly evaluate all matters before town meeting. And vote in the best interest of the town. I support free speech and will treat others with mutual respect and conduct myself in a civil manner that is becoming of an elected town meeting member. I do solemnly swear that I will faithfully and impartially perform the duties incumbent upon me as a town meeting member of the town of Arlington in accordance with the bylaws, the town manager act and the general laws of the commonwealth, so help me God. Thank you. Did you both get a clicker? Did you get a clicker? Oh, good.
Uh, recognize the chair and the board of selectmen or the assistant this evening, Ms. Mahan. Vice chair, I'm not sure. What's... Thank you, Mr. Moderator. It is moved that if all the business of the meeting is set forth in the warrant for the annual town meeting is not disposed of at this session, when the meeting adjourns, it adjourns to Wednesday, May 6, 2015, at 8 p.m. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? No. Okay, then let's finish tonight. Announcements and resolutions. Mr. Bayer. Paul Bayer, Precinct 13. Uh, fellow town meeting members, at last week's sessions, we considered the selectmen's motion to create a community preservation committee. There were four amendments to change the process for appointing at-large members and one amendment related to term limits for at-large members. There was considerable debate about the appointment process amendments, which ended when a motion was passed to terminate debate on all matters under the article. As a result, there was no discussion of the term limits amendment, nor of the majority of the three-page bylaw proposed by the selectmen. This could have been avoided if the motion to terminate debate had been restricted to the appointed relate, appointment related amendments. I recommend to fellow, my fellow town meeting members when moving to terminate debate that they consider whether it makes sense to terminate debate on all matters under the article or whether it might make more sense to terminate debate only on particular amendments that may have already been adequately discussed. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Baer. Sir? Yep. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. That's Steve DeCourcy, Precinct 2. Just want to announce again tonight that the Arlington High School girls tennis team is here to sell baked goods. Um, tonight's been a, today's been a particularly tough day for them. They had a match in Wilmington that they won. They didn't get back to Arlington until about quarter of seven and got right down here. So I'm sure that you would, uh, they would appreciate your support this evening and encouragement because um, at this point in the season, which I don't think we've been able to say this for 15 or 20 years, if the season ended today, they'd qualify for the state tournament. They still have a ways to go, but uh, they're, they're working towards their goal. Sir? <clears throat> no, you. Go ahead. No, you're next, Barbara. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Jeremy Marin, Precinct 16. Just a, a brief reminder. Uh, uh, this coming Thursday, May 7th, the DPW is going to be having their uh, new Rot and Roll event at the DPW parking lot. From 4 until 7 o'clock, you can get all of those burning, critical compost questions that you have answered. There's going to be free compost available. There's going to be discounted bins, presentations for kids, for adults alike, uh, looking at the science. Lex Farm will be there. Habitat will be there. A number of others. Uh, when, uh, sorry, excuse me, Thursday, May 7th from 4 until 7. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Costa. Barbara Costa, Precinct 10. I'm just calling your attention that to the fact that I've left uh, a page at the back about an uh, update on the Arlington Commission on Arts and Culture, of which I'm a co-chair. To just update you, this body had um, formed or had, had charged the commission, and we have been, um, we're, one of the things we're excited about doing, uh, we're just as letting you know our intent to apply for cultural district designation from the state, from Mass Cultural Council. And it's a process we're starting. We hope people from various arts and cultural organizations and businesses will get together to work on this. I think one great outcome is that we will have interesting ways to coordinate all these entities in our town. Plus, it'll put us a little bit more on a map on the uh, website for the Mass Cultural Council. Um, we do have, in, you know, in the in the intent of gathering all these groups and having coordination more among our arts and culture organizations. We do have a website with a calendar. I just wanted to call your attention to it. It's only as good as those who use it and list things. You can, um, you know, there is on this piece of paper an email where you can uh, send any announcements of, of the arts and culture variety and you'll see some of our uh, guidelines on the website as well. 
And then also to say that um, one of the things, one of the duties we're, we are charged with uh, as a Commission on Arts and Culture is to develop a cultural plan for the town. So we will be starting to work on that as well as a great dovetail to the master plan. All right, thank you. Thank you. Look for this in the back. Anybody else? Mr. Tossi, did you have something? I lay Article 3 upon the table. Yeah, second. All in favor of putting Article 3 on the table, please, oh, taking it off the table, please say yes. yes. Okay, thank you. Any opposed? None. Any um, other reports of committees? Mr. Gilligan. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Stephen Gilligan, Town Treasurer. I move that the report of the Town Treasurer to the 2015 Annual Town Meeting be received. All in favor of receiving the report, please say yes. Yes. Opposed? It is so received, Mr. Gilligan. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Mr. Moderator, if I could just point out one thing. There is a new exhibit on the very last page of the report. Exhibit 5 refers to foreclosure redemption revenue. Uh, we've begun a program uh, we're now in the third year, whereby any delinquent tax property that has exceeded $20,000 in delinquent taxes and or been delinquent for more than three years, uh, we have taken extreme steps to contact uh, property owners or estates and where that failed have proceeded with foreclosure in land court. Uh, I'm pleased to report that um, Technically, we've only foreclosed on two pieces of property. They are now in redemption, but those foreclosure proceedings have resulted in estates and or owners uh, paying the town the money's due. And you'll notice that we have received over $409,000 since we began this program. Uh, this is phase one. Phase two, which will begin July 1st, and we'll, we hope to have accomplished within the next fiscal year, uh, we'll bring in another 400000 in addition to that, and phase three will bring in another a quarter of a million dollars. Our anticipation is that we will have unreal, unanticipated uh, revenues of over a million dollars. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you, Mr. Gilligan. Any other reports of committees? Seeing none, Mr. Trosty. I move that Article 3 be laid upon the table. All in favor of laying three upon the table, please say yes. yes. Opposed? Article three is on the table. That brings us back to Article seven. Oh, yeah, test vote. Here we have to test our clickers. Um, tonight's test vote is, as soon as you're ready, Mr. Renault. Ready? Okay. Whether or not tomorrow will get over 75 degrees. One for yes, two for no. And go ahead and vote. Apparently, 135 of us think it will. Hey, um, this doesn't work. Norm, this doesn't work. That brings us back to Article 7. Um, ne next on the list was Stephen Harrington. Um, there was someone on the right-hand side. Oh, did you move over here? I don't know who they were, but there were about five people back on the right the other day, way far right. Is that you? Did you move here? No. Was it you, Mr. Radosha? Yep. Then come on up. You're up.
Perfect. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Marta, right up, Bob Radosha, Precinct 11. Uh, when I first heard about this article, I was, I don't want to say excited, but I was happy that we we're going to finally address this clutter issue that seems to be prevalent about town. Um, but then as I read it and I get to understand it some more, um, it wasn't legal in the first place. And so now we're going to make it legal. And I'm not sure how this is going to make it any better. For example, if um, we could, oh, we're up there. Okay, the, the top slide shows, that was a yard sale sign for September 20th that was placed in the middle of September. On the, at the selectmen's meeting on the 24th of November, I sh showed this picture and asked, how do we get these things taken care of? Now, that was well over two months, and it was a week into it, so it close to December when that was taken down. Now, that's located, oops, where over 10,000 vehicles go by it every day. That's according to some traffic studies that were done in the past. It's probably closer to 15,000. And how that could go unnoticed and unattended, I, d I don't understand it. Now, the next one down, it's not that clear, but it shows the traffic pole, the light pole in the center with all of the garbage on it. And a lot of that stuff had been there well beyond the date of the event. And I look at that and could we just do one more? And I think it's there. And more of the same thing in the center. These, these signs, outdated, they're still there. Now it's a question of, I understand, if it's a telephone pole, it's okay. But my question is, are the traffic signal poles, the metal ones, are they telephone or are they town property? And if it's town property, then I think, the problem might go away, but if it's not, then we still have it. I'm not sure how it's going to be enforced, um, but and there's going to be a cost to enforce it if we do. I don't think I should be walking the streets four days after an event and then going down to see Chief Ryan and say, what are you going to do about this? You know, Give him a list of things, but I'm not sure who's going to actually uh, look into it and enforce it or keep it active, but I think in the meantime, it just it feels like another bylaw that feels good but does nothing, and why are we wasting our time? Thank you. Thank you, sir. Mr. Bayer? Yep, you're on the list too, miss. Don't worry. Paul Bayer, Precinct 13. Um, with the moderator's permission, I'd like to um, make an amendment um, that I um, e that was emailed to members and is up on the screen because it only involves um, two words. He uh, allowed me to, to do it without um, putting um, 250 pieces of paper uh, on your chairs. Um, the motivation for this amendment was that as I read the article, it says, it says that a person, and that could be the manager of a theater or the manager of a restaurant or a owner of a store can post a, a, a notice for a public event. That event could be a concert or a, a holiday brunch or a one-day sales event. And there would seem to me be nothing to stop um, any of the merchants in town from posting a notice under this um, bylaw. So my proposal is that we add the words non-commercial before the words public event so that only the kinds of events that I believe were intended with this article would uh, actually be allowed under this uh, bylaw. Thank you. Thank you. That's for us. Yes? Yep. Hello, I'm Pam Hallett from Precinct 21, and I want to introduce a resident from Precinct 21, Peter Anaza. He's going to speak to the motion. Oh, name and address for the record, sir. Yeah. Uh, Peter Nzana. Precinct 21, uh, 39 Summit Street, Arlington. I've been a uh, 
about a 45-year resident of Arlington. Um, as I know it and as I've read it, uh, we've had bylaws on signage being posted. Uh, signage, as I know it, I haven't seen it be enforced of either taken down in a manly time. It shouldn't even, as I read it, it should even be up in the first place. So we're allowing people to put signage up. Nobody's enforcing it. I've called numerous times, whether it be the uh, public works department, selectmen, policemen, believe me, nobody takes these signs down. Nobody enforces it. So we have these bylaws. They're not being enforced. So now what do we want to do? We want to change this, and we want to add a different bylaw to allow signage to be posted on telephone poles. Uh, but it's always been on telephone poles, forever. So we're going to say now into law, okay, you can put them on telephone poles. What about our nice decorative poles, our green poles, our clock up in uh, heights, all those nice green lamps we have, and all that kind of stuff? It's terrible. People have been putting stuff on here for years. They've been putting on with duct tape, all kinds of tape. They don't take it down in a manly, manly fashion, timely fashion. It's illegal in the first place. It's not hard to enforce this. Yes, it takes manpower, but there's addresses on all this signage. Yeah, we're having a yard sale so and so place. Yeah, we're having garage sales here. Yeah, call this guy here. It's there. There's record of who you can call, and it's not done. So now it's being proposed to relax the law to be put on telephone poles. I don't know if that's a great thing. Certainly not to allow folks to put it on our decorative poles. That, that's, you know, we talk about having Arlington have a more quality door. That's the first place we can go, is to make those poles look nice and actually paint them. And I've complained about it. Nobody does anything about it. It is not enforced. So now, I don't know how we're going to enforce this new bylaw. I don't know if it's a good thing. I'm not sure. But uh, I think you people should know these bylaws that have been there for years have not been enforced. Believe me, I've seen it and I've gone by it. So if you want better quality, let's keep at least that and make it strict to keep these nice poles at least decent and clean and painted. And, and that's about all I have to say about it. But uh, I don't know how we can put teeth in it. It's going to take manpower. But the, the addresses are there and on where these things are being taken place. I, believe me, I've called everybody on police, public works, selectmen. Nobody's acted on it. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you, sir. Mr. Smith? Yes. Ms. Stamps? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. From what I remember from the last meeting, I wanted to ask, um, it's not clear to me that this bylaw um, applies to signs on private property. Doug? Well, it, oh, it does not no. say that it does not apply to private property. I think it could be interpreted to mean any signs anywhere throughout the town. M Mr. Um, Heim? Article 0.7. Being told that under 7, Doug, can you explain it? Oh, Diane's gonna. I oh, miss Mahan, sorry. Um, if you look on page two of your selectman's report, draft regulations for the display of notices. Number seven, notices cannot be placed on private property without the consent of the property owner. I hope that answers the question. That answer your question? It's not in the bylaw, it's in their regulations. In their draft regulations. Yeah, I saw that, but for example, the number one that regulates the, um, and I'm not against regulating notices, I understand the issue, but um, like for example, it, it talks about the materials that have to be, um, the notices have to be constructed of, and I don't know if that applies to private property. Doug, Mr. Heim. 
Doug Heim, Town Council. The, what you see in the selectman's comments are uh, draft regulations. The actual vote tonight, is, or hopefully tonight, is only to uh, take a limited category of what is now considered signs and reclassify them and give the selectmen the ability to promulgate regulations that would be more flexible than our current zoning bylaws with respect to um, this limited category of things. So uh, these draft regulations for the display of notice are really there for informational purposes. They're subject to change, public comment, um, but they were drafted with the idea that town meeting should have some idea of what the types of regulations these changes uh, would allow might look like. Okay, that's fine, thank you. Mr. Leonard. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. John Leonard, Precinct 17. Uh, Mr. Moderator, an idea might be that I see by the information on this article that it's a two-day maximum that uh, the signs will be allowed after the event. Just throwing out ideas and listening to the people that basically say and kind of agreeing with them that signs aren't removed, I would consider the fact that after two days, these notices or signs could be considered trash. Therefore, what you might want to consider is that leave it to the Department of Public Works to remove such trash. Now, a gentleman has mentioned that doesn't work, but something to consider is that in the regulations, it states on the back will be the telephone number and name of the sponsor. I would entertain the idea that if the Department of Public Works came to me with a number of signs that they removed days after the event, that maybe the town could consider some kind of a fee and or charge against the individual for leaving the signs up after two days. I will conclude by saying that years ago, I had the luxury to be part of a committee co-sponsored by John Billifer and Sherry Barron, I believe it was the Millennium Committee. And on that committee, one of the things we did was we went through the town from Cambridge to Lexington, putting up signs I believe at the time it was for a seniors event. We took the time to write down on a piece of paper every single location, every store, whatever it might be, of where we put this sign up, and we informed the people we will be back. Once the event was over with, we again walked from Cambridge to Lexington, following our list, removed all the signs, and at certain places got a pat in the back for a job well done because some people were surprised to see that you kept your word and you came back and removed your signs. Just something to think about, Mr. Moderator. Thank you. I hope the selectmen take your comments into consideration when they draft the regulations if we pass this bylaw. Um, it's the person right down there, right? Three from the back, white shirt, two people in. Yep, you. I don't know your name, I'm sorry. Watch it, EJ. Mona Zeftal, Precinct 12. Um, I have, um, I guess, an objection to the, on table one, lost pet. It says time after event, it needs to be removed in two days. And as a pet owner, um, I haven't had to put up a sign, but I know I've seen lots of signs for lost dogs or cats, and a lot of times it's up for much longer than two days, and I don't think it's fair that those kind of signs, um, if someone hasn't found their pet, has to be removed in two days. 
it would be two days, I would think, after the pet is found, but I don't know that anyone would know that. I hope the selectmen take that under advisement as well. Basically, we are only voting on the changes of the bylaws, but not the draft regulations. Oh. But do you have something that you want to address, Ms. Mahan? I'll give you her words that she's going to consider that. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. As we said, this is a living, breathing, evolving do document. When we, the issue of lost pet was raised, was raised, erased. Um, first of all, the reason we put not applicable for when the t time duration before the event, you don't know when you're going to lose your pet. So, um, and then in terms of two days after the event, we considered the event being that you found your dog, cat, or um, other animal that was missing. So two days after the event of you finding him or her. So I guess my question is, who, is somebody going to be removing the flyers that people put up for lost pets? Ye other, other than the person? Because if somebody's going around and saying this was posted on May 15th, it's May 17th. How do they know whether the dog was, or cat was found? Um, on that one, the, the, a lot of it would be honor system. What we're trying to do with this is start as a basis for people saying the signs go up, they stay there forever. Why don't you do something about it? So we came up with some regulations about what the signs should be, when they should go up, when they should go down, have a number there. Um, I'm not going to speak for the administrative staff and the Board of Selectmen, but years ago I used to work in there. What I anticipate is now lots of times we would get questions about why is that sign still up there and we didn't really know where it came from. If we have a number on file in the selectman's office, we can call them. I would okay. anticipate we would do that. Um, and I think if it got to a point that was really abusive to a previous speaker's um, query, um, I would look to the town manager in terms of um, if it's something really prevalent in terms of whether we need to engage DPW and how Mr. Chapdelaine would want to proceed on that. But we're, we're okay. just, this is just a starting point. Okay. But I am listening to what I, and the rest of the board to everything that you're all saying tonight. Thank you. Hey, thank Mr. Chaplain, did you have something further to add to Ms. Mahan? Go ahead. Adam Chapdelaine, town manager. Uh, just in response to a number of the comments and questions, uh, both under the current bylaw and under the potentially newly adopted bylaw uh, being considered tonight, uh, the level of service that would be supported by both a combination of inspectional services and DPW would be an enforcement-based compliance. Uh, there, there wouldn't be the ability to do any kind of active compliance with timelines that would be adopted. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. McKinney. Mr. McKinney, once I point at you and wave, you can stop waving your hand. Come on up. Lawrence McKinney, Precinct 7. Um, I come to you with some experience in this as a small time impresario. I once photographed a, uh, you know, telephone pole that had no less than three different posters that I had actually created uh, for a small theatrical event, a concert at Payne Hall, and I believe a lecture. I once did a study and discovered that the most expensive way to advertise is direct mail. Uh, the most effective way to advertise, if you're small, is to do something really good and put posters near where it happens, and you can get a lot of action. On the other hand, there is a rule among thieves, which you might understand, was I went around, if that was already, already happened, rip it down. Now, I have heard over and over again, call the DPW or call the police. You don't do that. You walk up and with your hands, if it's over the time, and you rip it down. You have the power. <laughs> Take it. Thank you. Very good. Uh, Mr. McCabe, Mark. Mark McCabe, Precinct 2. I stand to terminate debate on Article 7 and all matters before it. We have a motion to terminate debate. It's been seconded. Um, let's cue up the magic box over there, Mr. Renault. We have a motion to terminate debate on all issues. I, one is yes, two is no. As soon as we get the uh, signal.
Okay. Oop. Oh. Ready? All right, go ahead and vote. One is yes, two is no. This is to terminate debate. Debate is terminated to the two-third vote, and I so declare it. All right, so we have before us two different bylaws. One is a zoning bylaw by the Redevelopment Board, which has two proposed amendments to it, Mr. Harrington's and Mr. Bayer's. And we have a bylaw am um, amendment by the selectmen with two amendments to each of them. Both of the amendments, proposed amendments, affect both zoning and town by law. Because the zoning by law requires a two third vote, and the town by law only requires a majority vote, I'm going to split the vote into two separate parts. First, we're going to vote on the redevelopment board, which requires two thirds. We're going to vote the two amendments, then the Redevelopment Board, whether or not we amended it. If that passes by two-thirds, we're going to move on and vote on the Selectman's recommended vote for the town bylaw. I'm told that if the Redevelopment Board vote fails, then the Selectman don't want theirs to go because it's an all or nothing. We either got to pass both bylaws or neither of them because <coughs> you need both to be effective. So. If you're clear on how we're going to vote, that's it. If you're not clear on how, what we're going to do, and I haven't explained what we're voting on yet. So is the order of voting ready? You all understand? Good. Excuse me, sir? Oh, I missed you. So first, we're going to take up the redevelopment board, the two-third vote. We're going to address Mr. Harrington's amendment. Mr. Harrington wants to add the words town committee or student organization right on the part A, second sentence, so it would read notice temporary sign erected by a town committee, student organization, person, nonprofit, etc. That's Mr. Harrington's amendment. Are you ready, Mr. Reno? Yeah. A majority vote on the amendment. A majority vote on the amendment. So this is whether or not you want to add town committee and student organization into the list of persons, as Mr. Harrington proposed. As soon as Mr. Reno's ready, he's over there fat, furiously punching keys. Ready? And vote. One for yes, two for no. Yes, we want to add those words, two, no, we don't. All right, 142 people in the affirmative. 63 in the negative. It is so amended by Mr. Harrington's. That carries. Now we're going to vote on Mr. Baer's amendment. Mr. Baer wants to add the words in that same sentence. So it would be temporary signs erected by town committee, student organization, person, nonprofit organization for the purpose of advertising an individual yard sale non-commercial public event or lost pet. If you want to add those words non-commercial in, you'll vote yes. If you do not, then you'll vote no. As soon as you're ready, Mr. Renault, again, it's a majority vote. All right, go ahead and vote.
That also carries by 143 to 59. So now we're going to take the vote on the redevelopment board's vote, recommended vote, as amended. This is a two-thirds vote. So if you want to have this bylaw, we vote by two-thirds. Do, 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 do. And here we go. Go ahead and vote one for yes, two for no. It carries 173 in the 171 in the affirmative, 35 in the negative. Okay, so that passed. Now we're going to go to the recommended vote of the Board of Selectmen. Now, since we just went through what we did, do we have to go through the whole explanation each time, or can we just vote on the two amendments? Okay, good. We're just going to vote on the two amendments because we all understand what they're going to do. So first we have Mr. Harrington's amendment to add town committee and student organization into the body of the text. Mr. Renault, when you please. I should. I'll take the next one by voice. He's halfway through it. Okay, and we can vote on Harrington's amendment. All in favor, please vote one for yes to amend. Hundred sixty two to thirty nine, it carries. Uh, Mr. Doe, may I suggest you just queue up the last vote? I'll take Mr. Bayer's vote by voice. So just queue up the regular vote while we take a voice vote. So all in favor of Mr. Bayer's amendment to amend to add public event and non commercial, please say yes. Yes. Opposed? No. That is a <laughs> it's a majority vote and I so declare it. That passes as well. Now we have the recommended vote of the Board of Selectmen as amended by Mr. Harrington and Mr. Bayer's vote. Mr. Renault, are you ready? And go ahead and vote yes. I want to vote for the Selectmen's bylaw amendment as amended. Bless you. Carries 177 the affirmative, 30 in the negative. It is an affirmative vote, and I so declare it. That 130. That finishes Article 7. That brings us to Mr. Tosti. If you. On Monday, I told you that the uh, superintendent of Minuteman uh, will be here to present his budget and answer any questions. Uh, so I would like try to give him a little special consideration considering he has 16 towns to go to, 16 town meetings. So uh, in regards to that, I move that we table Articles 12 through 23, bringing up Article 28. We have a motion to table Articles. 
what he just said, something through 23, bringing up Article 12 now, through can 23. Can you say it again? I didn't hear the exact ones. 12 through 23. 23. And that'll bring up Article 28. All in favor of tabling, please say yes. Yes. Opposed? It's an affirmative vote, and I so declare it. Mr. Tosti, Article 28. Yes, I'd like to uh, introduce uh, Dr. Bo Quillen, uh, Superintendent of uh, Minuteman Vocational School. And Dr. Bo Quillen is going to be addressing his budget. Correct? Yep. Go ahead, Mr. Dr. Bo Quillen. Um, as I'm getting a copy of the budget, I just wanted to congratulate Minuteman Arlington Jr., Julia Rutterman, who, t who entered uh, the Pioneer Institute Frederick Douglass Essay Contest, and out of 66 different schools, Julia won first place and collected $5,000 today. Well, um, uh, the last town meeting, you, you, hopefully you have this in front of you, and I'm just going to go quickly through the slides. Um, overall, on uh, page one, slide two, the Minuteman <clears throat> operating budget for FY16 is up 0.9%, less than 1% at $19.8 million. Um, w things that we're driving our budget for FY16 is we're transitioning to a smaller school. <clears throat> Excuse me. You may recall that a year ago, um, the Minuteman School Committee voted to reduce the size of the school, and this budget is the first budget that moves towards that vote. Uh, we'll be implementing 16 programs. We currently have 19. Um, we also began uh, to fund our OPEB trust with $50,000 in this budget. We're continuing to fund critical building repairs. Um, our health insurance was up slightly, and our school bus transportation contract, which we just opened a few weeks ago, is um, up about 3% as well. Um, slide four, there's been a change in our special education assessments to our member communities. Back in 2012, the Department of Education asked us to review how we were assessing member communities and non-member communities for special ed services. And I'll just remind you that Minuteman has about 49% of its students are receiving some special services through an IEP. That's the highest in the state of any school in Massachusetts. So going forward, there, would be, there will be no special ed assessment on a per pupil basis to our member towns. It will be based on the overall enrollment and shared across all member town students. We will continue to charge non-resident communities an additional $4,500 for students on an IEP, and that $4,500 is being based on the previous year's per pupil expenditures for the services we've provided. Beyond FY16, I wanted to mention this on page three, slide five. <clears throat> As we're establishing a smaller school, we're closing two programs, we're adding two programs, and we're merging some programs. Um, the focus is, that we're moving forward with, and we've always been moving forward with this, but we were beginning to see some um, glimmers of positive response to increasing in-district enrollment. The program closures will have cost implications. If we close a program, the Department of Education has to approve that closure. We're closing marketing and telecommunications. But we have to make sure that we provide the services and the instruction until all of those students have graduated. So in FY17 and a little bit in FY18, we're gonna be slightly overstaffed in a couple of those program areas. <clears throat> Over on enrollment is 745. That includes member towns, non-member towns, as well as postgraduate students. On, <coughs> on slide number eight, um, you can see the overall enrollment in grades 9 through 12. After four years of increases, we had a dip this year. Our Arlington enrollment on slide 8 um, is down uh, seven, uh, 
13 students to 152. And that's the basis for the Arlington assessment, which you'll see on slide nine. The overall assessment for Arlington is $4,010,950, including transportation, capital, postgraduate students. Our FY16 revenue, one of the reasons our assessments for all of our member towns went up almost 6% was because of decline in revenue specifically, or the majority of that decline, you'll see on the third bullet on slide 10 was from a decrease in non-resident tuition. That decrease is based upon two factors. One, the Commissioner of Education which sets that rate <clears throat> is reducing the rate for all non-resident tuition rates across the Commonwealth from 150% of foundation down to 125%. Roughly that translates from a tuition rate of about 18,500 to a tuition rate of about 17,200 is our estimate. In addition, we were accepting fewer non-resident students as we're moving towards a smaller school. Now the revenue plan on slide 11, you can see uh, the assessments to member towns are about 10.9 million. Our chapter 78, about 2.1 million. We're anticipating a reimbursement of transportation of about 800,000. You can see the drop in prior year tuition. Current year tuition is 400,000. That's what we're gonna be collecting next year. And then we've appropriated 145,000 from excess and deficiency. Overall budget on slide 12 based upon state function codes, you'll see a drop in administration, an increase in student instructional services of about 2%. That reflects a 2% increase in teacher contract for next year. Um, also our debt service is up 56,000. We've been in a feasibility study with the MSBA for close to six years, and the, the borrowing now requires a principal payment, and that's where that 56,000 comes from. Then you can see the uh, capital expenditures and repairs that we're anticipating for next year. Basically, uh, some building maintenance issues having to do with the uh, fire alarm and interior doors, an emergency generator, some transportation vehicles that will be used by our horticulture landscaping as well as maintenance and operations. And we're funding our, our stabilization fund, which is set up for capital projects and repairs. Um, we're putting $100,000 into the capital expenditures um, stabilization fund. You're almost out of time, doctor. I had a couple of slides about the building project, but um, as we go into questions, I can answer more specific questions about that as we go. Um, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you. <clears throat> Mr. Ha oh, Mr. Harrington. Stephen Harrington, Precinct 13. First, I want to um, thank Dr. Pocolin for, um, I think he always does an excellent job in terms of the um, report we get for a budget. You know, it's easy to read. I think it's very good. Um, I also want to thank him for the um, for Minuteman. I think it's an excellent institution. Um, I know a lot of people who were in the first graduating class, they were friends and, um, and relatives have graduated from there recently, and uh, they do an excellent job. And so uh, I wanna thank them for that. And I do have a question. Um, you said that uh, your total operating budget was up less than 1%, is that correct? That's correct, yes. And you said that you have um, almost 50% of the students who are on IEPs? This year, that's correct, 49.7, I believe. That's amazing, how do you do that? <laughs> um, all I can say is that I'm very proud of our staff and the way that we um, manage students who require accommodations. If you think about the Minuteman education, it's the typical term that people use is it's a hands-on education. What I like to say is that what we're really doing is trying to address a multitude of unique learning styles and we have flexibility to do that in a vocational technical environment that you really don't see in a regular classroom of a high school where students are like you, sitting there listening to someone. Um, our learning is done by engaging students in a number of different ways and 
When you find, when students find what they love to do and do well, they're motivated to learn in a very powerful way. And I think that is um, how I would explain how we do it. So, uh, Mr. Moderator, could I ask a question of um, our school department? Is, is it our special ed costs are seven percent? Is that is that That's, right? You'll have to ask that during the school department budget. You... Okay, so I think it's seven percent. Correct me if I'm wrong. So it's amazing that these guys are keeping it with probably three or four times the uh, percentage of special needs students with an operating budget of increase of 1%. I mean, it's just, it's incredible that they're able to do that. So um, thank you very much for your, um, your service, Doctor. Thank, thank you, you, sir. Um, <clears throat> Mr. Hainer. Thank you, Mr. Moderator, Bill Hainer, Precinct 2. Uh, just, uh, I got a little bit confused. The special education charge, you said for non-resident, uh, you're charging $4,500? That's correct. No matter what the IE IEP en encompasses? No. Uh, the, what the department asked us to do and what we did, we had some help doing it, was to develop a formula which came up with a per-pupil assessment which is based on average assessment, which is based upon the previous year's expenditures for all of the IEPs of non-resident students. So it's a... So, I'm a little bit confused. So, student from town one, mm -hmm. say, I'm just hypothetical figures, sure. $100 charge, student uh, town two, 9,000 uh, less $100, comes out an average of 4,500. So the, the, the town, the, okay, you've answered that. I, I've got that. The, the charges for special ed from Arlington, does Arlington itself get assessed anything beyond the tuition for the IEP? No. So if, if a child came to you with, for a better term, a very expensive IEP, that would have to be absorbed in, in the tuition that we pay. That would be absorbed across all member town tuitions and averaged so across. So it's not only the non-resident, it's the, uh, the resident towns, we do an average too? Yes. Okay, I just want a town meeting to, I don't know how many of you saw the Globe uh, Sunday. Uh, there was an, we have 152 students, no other town member town has the member, we do. I'm a little nervous on the, on the average, on, on doing this average, I can understand it may work, it may not work. I'm just concerned about it. Thank you. I hear you. May I respond briefly, Mr. Moderator? Uh, bri briefly. Um, Bill, I think it probably helps Arlington because we're spreading the cost of special ed not across Arlington's 152 students, but across all 413 non-resident students. I appreciate that. Uh, I'm, I just think each town should carry its burden. If we had, if, if we had 49% of our students of the 152, if we only had six, mm -hmm. I don't know. I, I'm concerned about it, that's all. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Um, the gentleman over here, right here. Glad, sure, yep. Mustafa Varagli, Precinct 10. Uh, the numbers went by quickly, so I want to clarify them, if, sure. if you don't mind. Um, so the Arlington numbers here were assessed almost 23,000, just around by a couple hundred there per student. Correct. And then what I understood was the non-resident towns are assessed 18,000. Did I well, misunderstand that? The basic tuition <clears throat> for a non-resident is set by the commissioner. And for this budget year, that is $18,300. It does not include special education. It does not include transportation. Um, mm -hmm. And I should mention this, it does not include capital, although going forward, we are going to be allowed to charge non-residents for a capital project. So, so if we rolled 4,500 and it's about 1,000, um, I was just eyeballing, it's about actually 2,500 for transportation. So 152 um, going into 248. I figured it's about 1,500 or so for transportation, give or take. 
So 1,500 plus 4,500 plus 18,000. So a non-resident town is paying 24,000 with no property Between assessment. 24 and 28, depending on the town they come from, yes. Because some, some towns send us a lot of students, okay. so their transportation cost is pretty low. So it's, at the low end, it's very, very close to being a resident town. Yes. Okay. And going forward, is that going to, I mean, should we bring people into the resident town so they carry? I would love to bring some people okay. into the district. So is there, uh, I don't really, I was, I tried, I did, I was surprised when I heard the 18,000, and I'm trying, in my mind, I understood that the resident towns maybe should pay less than the non-resident towns. Mm -hmm. Um, in a substantive way. <laughs> well, one of the things that non-residents towns, they do not get a vote. Um, I guess the issue around what residents and non-residents pay has been an issue I've been trying to understand myself and address for the last nine years that I've been superintendent on. Our budget going up only 0.1%, and as we go to a smaller school, hopefully as we go to a, a renovated or a newer school, our operating costs are going to be significantly lowered. And if you look, our goal is to hit the 125% of foundation in our overall budget. And this, we went from 165% to 151 in this budget, and we're well on the way to meeting that. So the, the delta between non-resident and resident is going to start to um, swing in the favor of non-residents as we move forward. Okay. And then while the budget only went up 1%, there was a 10% increase in capital costs for Arlington. I'm rounding the numbers, maybe it's eight or nine yes. or something, um, but I'm, just to make life easy. So we're paying 10% more than we did last year, or 8%, or you, you probably have an exact number, um, despite the low growth in the budget. Yes. Okay. Right. I mean, I don't think there's anything that's going to change, but I just wanted to clarify those. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Vergle. Ms. Thornton? <clears throat> Thank you. Barbara Thornton, Precinct 16. Thank you very much for coming. I have a couple of questions. One, I see that the Medicaid reimbursement stopped at uh, a couple of years ago. Why was that? Well, we stopped using it as part of our revenue plan because it was very difficult to predict. We still receive around fifteen dollars to $20,000 a year, some years more, some years less but we decided not to use it as a revenue stream because it was so small. But are you still billing it as aggressively? Oh, yes. Because I would think with the IEPs that you're describing, you'd have a substantial Medicaid reimbursement opportunity. It's not as substantial as that number might indicate because our students are not what you might call moderate to severe needs in regards to the accommodations. They're, mm -hmm. I don't want to say they're minor, they're important and we take care of them, but they're not, um, as what you might find in Arlington on the average. Okay. Um, second, uh, uh, there's, I always had, particularly after reading the Minuteman article in the Globe the other day, mm. sort of the, that there's a free rider uh, sense that as an Arlingtonian taxpayer uh, that, that the people that are not part of the district uh, get an opportunity, particularly around the capital piece. Mm. Are you contemplating, I mean, the new construction is substantially lower than a uh, uh, rehab yeah. construction. Is that because you're going for a substantially lower population? And is that population going to be excluding some of the non-district members? Wow, there's a lot in that question. Um, I'll sit down and let you answer it. <laughs> okay, well, remind me if I don't answer some of it, okay? Um, the, the Globe article quoted three models. Um, that we're required by the MSBA and the feasibility study to uh, have our design team submit three models, renovation, renovation addition, and new. And the, the Daedalus um, cost estimating firm, they're the ones that came up with that price of 85 million, all to accommodate the same number of students, which is 628. The, um, another part of your question was, is, are there going to be restrictions in regards to non-members? And the, and the answer is yes. Our admissions policy was changed to um, uh, limit the amount of non-member applications as we transition to that. That's going to take a few years. Um, one of the most exciting things that's happened over the last year in regards to the non-members participating in capital, uh, we've been working on this issue for a number of years. And in February of this past year, uh, the State Board of Education 
change the regulations regarding Chapter 74 and are now requiring that non-member communities participate in a capital project when the receiving school, such as Minuteman, is under an MSBA um, project. Will they have the same long-term commitment that we might have? It will, as long as there are non-member students coming to Minuteman, they will be paying for the capital project. Great. Yes. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, ma'am. Mr. Carmen. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Dean Carmen, Precinct 20. I think this is the fifth year maybe I've stood up on this article to talk about it, and I, I do so because I, I think it's important to break it down, talk about the issues, where we've been, where we are, and, and where we're heading. Um, e each year, and I'm not gonna spend as much, I mean, each year I get up here and I say the same thing about how I support the school. I think it's important. I think we need to provide, we definitely need to provide vocational education options for our children. So that's not why I'm standing here. Why I'm standing here is we continue to have very concerning finances at Minuteman. So Dr. McClellan started his presentation by saying the budget went up 1%. Great. Arlington's assessment goes up 6% this year, not 1%. And the reason we're going up 6% is as the school is getting smaller, we are spreading the fixed costs over a smaller population of students. And so if you go back historically, the last couple of years, we've had large increases. We have a 6% increase this year. We will most likely have a large increase again next year because it's the same function that's gonna happen. We're gonna take large fixed costs, smaller number of students, the numbers will go up. So it's, it's almost certain we'll be sitting here next year saying, hey, the budget's flat, the budget's up 1%, but Arlington's up 7%. That's not a place we can be. If you go through the packet that was handed out to you, in 2012, we were at about a $2.4 million assessment for Minuteman. Now we're at 4 million. That's a large number. Additionally, last year, we spoke about the regional agreement. I stood here and asked you to pass a regional agreement that was going to be better for Arlington. Well, it appears the regional agreement is not going to pass all communities, so we're back to this really odd UN model where Dover, who I'll pick on, um, that sends one student, has the chair of the building committee for Minuteman, came to us last Thursday to talk about how great building a building would be and how Arlington should pay $1.8 million in debt service, while well, Dover's gonna pay 37,000 a year in debt service. And I jokingly said to the person next to me, wow, I bet one resident of Dover could pay for that when you look at their wealth. And so it's concerning. I mean, we're going, to, we're, at four, we're going to be at four million this year. We also have a building project that we're being asked for. And the building project at this point, if you came last week, if you've been following it, I don't like to call it anymore a negotiation. I like to call it, it is more, it is a hostage taking. They are telling us there are three options that are going to be that are M, could be MSBA approved, and if you don't go with any of those three, there are two other options they are going to go forward with, and that's very difficult for Arlington. We are the largest member. We send a third of the students. We need to do something. Unfortunately, through the good efforts of and now, now here's the part where you're going to think I'm, this is on. It's taking a weird direction. I have always and will always support the superintendent of Minuteman. I think he does a great job. I think he's trying his hardest. I think he worked his tail off to amend the original agreement, to do everything he could to bring things in line. Unfortunately, it is becoming clear that it, the 16 member towns aren't gonna work together. Everyone's gonna vote in their interest. We're not going to get a resolution. We are, we are most likely at the point where we're gonna have to take an almost, I don't say unprecedented step, but a very uncommon step at some point of asking our legislator, legislators in the general court to intervene, to stop, to help work it together at a level above the member communities. Because it seems like that's the only way that we can fix this. And it seems like a little bit of a, I don't want to say radical step, or, 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 or I don't know how to put it, but there's no, there's no other way to get a school that sends one child and pays $25,000 a year to Minuteman to agree to the, to the district that pays $4 million. I mean, it's just not going to work. And so, you know, as I have in the past, as I do tonight, I, I, I felt the need to stand up here and just talk about some of the larger issues and, and where we're heading. It has nothing to do, and I'm going to say this again, it has nothing to do with vocational education as a value. It's definitely something we should be, you know, investing in. It's definitely something we should 
be working towards. It has nothing to do with the superintendent, who I think worked his darndest to try to get it to work. It has to do with the economics. And, and I will leave you with this thought. If, hypothetically, if we pass this budget this year, if we pass this budget next year, let's just say that we put the building um, project on the, you know, let's say the building project got approved next year and the $1.8 million a year went on the tax roll. We would be spending approximately 4 to 5 percent of the overall town budget for 133 students. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Mr. Chappett? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Roland Chappett, Precinct 12. Very quickly, I want to say I'm impressed with that school. You read the Globe article, and it needs to be redone. Some, it's getting old. It's worth the money. Whatever it spends, those kids get a good education up there. If you don't believe me, go up and take a look. There always is the door open up there. So we've never been to Minuteman. It's a nice trip. My one question, uh, Mr. Moderator, to the superintendent is on the, on the slide, I, I don't know if it's four or five, it talks about uh, closing two programs and adding two programs. And I've asked this before because I sense that, that the school is looking at needs across the board and tries to identify the ones that make the most sense in terms of education of the students. So, for example, I'm not going to argue with marketing and telecommunications being dropped because it's probably now somewhat passe in terms of what's going on up there. But I am curious about the new, two new programs. Uh, yeah, thank you, Mr. Moderator. We're, we're adding advanced manufacturing, um, in which underneath advanced manufacturing, we're combining our metal fabrication and welding program. And the other uh, new program is a really exciting program called um, Multimedia Engineering. Um, it's uh, fast becoming a, a, a very in-demand occupation. Um, it has to do, traditionally, uh, people understand it if I describe technical theater arts, but along with that comes other performance and exhibits and convention hall kinds of things, um, sound design, lighting design, set design, coordinating a number of multimedia technologies in an engineering format. We also have in the Boston area the Riggers Union, which is very excited about this program as well. So some, some of this new uh, media engineering, I assume you're, you're doing this on a cooperative basis with the, the, the uh, Minuteman community, Minuteman, I'm sorry, Middlesex Community College, for example. We have a, a, in this particular case, in that program, we're coordinating or collaborating with um, Suffolk University with the MIT Technical Theater Program, and we've actually had some of the folks involved in that come and speak to, to us. Uh, we're forming an advisory committee um, over the next six months, as we're required to when we start a new program. Okay, fine. That's just exactly what I wanted to hear, that you're, you're continually looking at where does it make the most sense to educate our kids from a, an employment basis? Absolutely. That's good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Woman in red back there, yep. Hello, I'm Deanne DuPont, Precinct, Precinct 13. I'm the parent of two Minutemen graduates, and I'm also on the school council at Minuteman High School. And I have to ditto that I feel that Minuteman provides an excellent education. It provides a great choice for students. And uh, I have a very successful son working at his dream job at Microsoft. So you can get very good jobs out of, uh, not directly out of Minuteman, he had to go to college, but um, he was much better prepared for his major where 50% of the students dropped out. But um, I just have a few questions related to the budget. One is I couldn't tell from the information how many students 
that the budget is based upon both high school students and postgraduate students, if they could be separated out, how many high school students and how many postgrad students? Um, I, th I think on slide. And that, that's for the total. There's 673 high school students. And if my math serves me right, about 75 postgraduate students. All right, and um, for the budget that we have going forward, is that on slide nine for Arlington? It's going down from 165 to 152 students, high school students? Yes. Is that correct? And then postgraduates, we have the cost per student, but. That 152 on FY16, that's based on the October 1, 2015 report, which includes both postgraduate and high school students, I believe. Well, the 152 does? Yes. Includes both? Yes. Based? We're required to report the postgraduate students, and they all actually help drive more Chapter 78 back to the, the district. Okay, so the 152 is the budgeted amount and includes both. And, and so, the, so we have a decrease in the population in the budget then. So we're going from 165 in the budget to 152 students. Yes, that's the basis of the assessment for FY16, right. 152. So if we looked at, instead of just looking at um, absolute numbers and total budget, if we looked at using um, a denominator, maybe not, a, yeah, denominator, like if you're looking at per student aggregate, is our budget actually going up? Our more? overall operating budget, including all students that we serve, is going up 0.9%. Okay. So is that an increase or decrease in the total population? Um, we're, we're planning for, as I said earlier, we're moving towards a school of 628. So, oh, oh. so it's a reduction. So, so in actually, if you looked at a per pupil basis, it's going up more than 9%. If you looked at per pupil. 0.9%. 0.9. .9. Yes. Yeah, so it's... If I understand your question, I think so, yes. Yeah, so I'm looking at, if you look at the total budget and you use the denominator as the total population, right. then the, the budget's actually increasing by more than 0.9% per student. Right, because but, you have a, a lower number of students in the budget. We don't, we don't actually know how many students we'll have next year. Right, of course. So... Okay, but it was based upon a lower number of students. Yes. Then I was hoping perhaps in the future, I understand some towns have it this way, if, and, but maybe I'm wrong, is if the high school information could be broken out from the postgraduate information. So I think it would be helpful when we're looking at comparing what the costs are to the Arlington High School, it would give us a, just a better picture of even you know, break, breaking out the sure. chapter, with 78 or whatever chapter that is, because um, I think, I think we forget in Arlington that you know if we had 150 more students at our high school, we would have to have a larger high school. We'd have to have more teachers. And I'm not saying that you know it's equivalent, but I think it'd give us a better way of just comparing these things because we would need a bigger high school here if all of a sudden you increase the high school population by 10%. Um, bear with me a minute. Um, When do, does Minuteman anticipate getting to the 628? Uh, in our modeling, we're, we're estimating that it would be three to five years. Okay. And then uh, I think one other question on slide 19. They have in it the assumptions um, for the cost of the renovation. It says that um, anticipating 8% annual enrollment increase. So a question I have is if the 
building is built for 628 students. Mm -hmm. And that's only high school students or 628 high school and postgraduate students? 628 high school students. Okay, so if it's built for 628 students, wouldn't, if there's a 8% increase the next year, we, the building would be outgrown? No, that, that's assuming if you, that was part of our modeling when we went all the way out to FY20. And so between now and FY20, we were assuming, making some assumptions. One of the assumptions was that we would have member town enrollment growth of about 8% a year. Okay, so this is just member town growth. So yes. then, then, then it would be absorbing the, the non-resident town growth would be, would be shrinking, shrinking. Got and it. the member okay. town growth would be increasing. All right, and um, I think that's, um, that's all my questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. The woman next to Elsie Fiore. Hi, um, Serena Memon from Precinct 21. I have a couple questions. First of all, I don't understand the numbers. Since um, you have 152 students this year uh, from Arlington, or oh, that's next year's projected. This year's 165 students, right? Um, no, we use the October 1 from the current year we're in to base the assessment for the next year. Uh, okay. So 165 was the number of students we had at Minuteman on October 1, 2013. 2013? Mm-hmm. Okay. And 152 was what we had as of October 1, 2014. Okay. All right. Um, also, this uh, project uh, with the renovations or uh, replacements, um, you're anticipating when on starting um, any of these projects? Is there a well, date? Well, these are just the models that will be going before the school committee to vote one of those models, and that would be submitted to the MSBA. Mm -hmm. The MSBA would then choose the model they think is best for the district. And for the next year, we would be developing more detailed schematic designs. And a year from now, we would go to all 16 town meetings and seek approval for the project. <laughs> if we were able to get all 16 towns to approve the project and any additional votes that may be required for debt exclusion by individual communities, um, it would be another year before construction started and probably three years after that it would start to impact the member district town budgets. We're, we're anticipating three years before we would start construction and three years after that to... to probably likely, yes. Okay. and. Um, my understanding of this is the member towns are 44% of the student body and 56% uh, come from outside the member towns? No, it's the opposite of that. Okay, I have uh, 331 that are from member and 414 from non-member is what I added up. No, it's, it's just the opposite oh, I see. of that. Okay, so 56 versus 44, which is a significant amount considering Arlington is 37% uh, of the students come from from this um, town. Um, <clears throat> so I understand the cost uh, uh, issues that are related. Also, I wanted to know about the co-ops. Are these students um, paid when they go on co-ops? And um, who collects the money, the students? <laughs> Most of our students are paid for their work-based learning experience. Um, the students are paid. Instead mm -hmm. of going to school during their shop week, they go directly to their employer. Um, we have about 50% of the seniors are, are participating in work-based learning right now. Okay. I want to know also about the transportation costs that are uh, increasing significantly um, and which communities are affected the most and why is it so? Our overall transportation budget, which we just rebid, <clears throat> um, we spend a significant amount of money on transportation because our district is close to 45 miles wide and about 25 miles going north and south. We have students all the way from, from Lancaster, Bolton, and Stowe. So we've always spent a significant amount on that. <clears throat> the budget, uh, I mean, the bids that we just opened were for a three-year bid and went up about 9% overall over the three years, but that, if you divide it, it's 3% a year. 
and that impacts all of our member communities. We don't provide transportation for non-member communities. Okay, good. <clears throat> um, that's good. At least they're taking care of their costs on that end. Uh, what I want to know is, what is CVTE? Is that uh, computer and visuals or something? Is in slide five and page three? CVTE stands for Career and Vocational Technical Education. And then um, I, I'm concerned, as Dean had mentioned, we're proposing about 145 million uh, uh, for this um, re improvements uh, at the minimum, up to 177 million and uh, anyway from 87 to 106 million um, costs for us. Um, it seems like quite a bit of money. So um, it doesn't seem like it's fair. Well, those costs are directly proportional to other new regional vocational schools mm -hmm. that have been built. And if you look nationwide, the cost of building a vocational technical high school is about 50% more expensive than an academic high school. So the costs are high, no doubt about it, but they're in line with other schools that have been recently built or are about to be built. Okay, and lastly, um, I just want to know, uh, th you say on the front page, uh, revolution in learning. Is this really the revolution in learning? Is that what you're uh, trying to emphasize? That's our uh, branding that was, um, oh. we came up with that tagline a few years ago. Okay, lastly, I just want to say, um, I don't think if we're worried about cost that maybe we should cut down on the blue ink, um, maybe colored ink, make it black and white for us. Thank Sorry, you. my two cents. <laughs> Thank you. All right, thanks. Thank you, Miss. Um, let's take 9.30, let's take our seven minute break. The tennis girls are selling cookies and coffee. My grandmother right there, her son went to the minute. Grandma, grandma. What year, yep, what year did uh, dad go to the man? On the list, I'm going to ask you a series of questions. Do you want me to tell you what they are now? Sure. Okay, so the first thing I'm going to ask you is I'm going to ask you if I'm getting any
we'll say everyone was. Well, last year we tried to have, we invited the whole town meeting up to this thing. Remember that? We had about 12 or 13 town meetings. That was good. We'll do it again. Please, please come on in. Mr. O'Brien has the floor. That's great. Yeah. Andy? <laughs> O'Brien, is that an Andy? You have the floor. Well, yep. <laughs> Mr. O'Brien has the floor. Go ahead, Mr. O'Brien, the microphones are loud. Right. Uh, Andy O'Brien, uh, Precinct 16. Uh, 
I don't know about you folks, but I, I really think four minutes really isn't long enough to hear from Dr. Bodie or Dr. Boquillen. Um, it'd be real, I think it'd be really nice to give them an extra three minutes, maybe next year. Uh, plus, we, a lot of us wouldn't come up here with a lot of questions. They'd probably a anticipate them in advance. Um, if, if, uh, Mr. Moderator, if I heard correctly, Dr. Boquillen had mentioned in his last 10 or 15 seconds that um, he was going to address uh, some aspects of the uh, building project. Was, was I correct in hearing that? We shut those hall doors. Um, Dr. Boquillen, did I, I provided some information on it if there was discussion on it, but I wasn't going to make a presentation on the building tonight. We yeah. made that Thursday evening at a, another meeting, but would be glad to answer any questions about it through the moderator. Um, well, I, I'd heard from one of the town meeting members that was there a possibility of three different um, building scenarios. Is that correct? Yes. The, we're submitting to the school committee on um, May 19th, three models that the school committee will debate and vote on one of those, and one of those models will then be submitted to the Mass School Building Authority, who will let us know in June or July which of the models they believe we should be building. Um, do you uh, have any idea of possibility what the numbers of what the cost of the rebuild will be? Yeah, the, uh, in the uh, handouts that I gave you, I think on the very last page, it provides the cost of the three state-funded models, which a uh, renovation is about $175 million, a renovation addition is about $174 million, and a brand new school is about $145 million. Okay, that's right. I remember that now. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Mr. Sean Harrington. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Sean Harrington, Precinct 15. Motion to terminate debate and all questions and matters before us. We have a motion to terminate debate. Do I have a second? Second. Thanks. <laughs> Ready on the motion to terminate debate. One is yes, I want to terminate. Two is no. Uh, go ahead and vote. One hundred twenty-nine in the affirmative, three in the negative. And I declare it's an affirmative vote to terminate debate. Oh, thirty-four in the negative. That brings us to the recommended vote of the Arlington Finance Committee. Door to fund Minuteman School District to the tune of four million ten thousand nine hundred and fifty dollars. Are you ready, sir? <coughs> He's ready. So one would be a yes vote. Two is no. So go ahead and vote. One yes, two no. One hundred and fifty six in the affirmative, sixteen in the negative. It's affirmative vote, and I so declare. And that terminates Article twenty eight. Mr. Tosti. I move that Articles twelve through twenty three be taken off the table. All in favor of taking Articles twelve through twenty three off the table, please say yes. yes. Opposed say no. It is affirmative vote, Articles. 12 through 23 are off the table. We now have before us Article 12, Revision of Town Committee, Vision 2020 Standing Committee. Ms. Mahan. Um, the, you have the board's vote contained in your um, packet before you. And if I could, uh, Julie Brazil, uh, the, one of the members of Vision 2020 would like to, oh, I'm sorry. Sorry about that. Um, you have the selectman's recommended vote contained on your seats before you, and um, if 
If I could ask town meeting if Julie Brazil could come up briefly, a member of Vision 2020, to explain the changes. Ms. Brazil can speak as a town resident. Ms. Brazil? And as a member of the committee. Julie Brazil, Precinct 12, and chair of the Vision 2020 Standing Committee. Um, just a couple minutes of background. Not everybody understands um, what we mean when we say Vision 2020 because it's actually an organization of many parts. There's the standing committee and then there are task groups. Um, there's one task group associated with each of the nine town goals and uh, there can be multiple committees within a task group. Uh, in addition, um, the, then, so then there's the standing committee, which is what we'll talk about tonight, that is responsible for reporting to town meeting. That's the part that's actually created by town meeting. Um, the standing committee serves to connect all of the task groups with each other and to connect the task groups with the town leaders and elected officials who, under this proposal, would be pulled out into our advisory board. Um, the task groups are designed to be very flexible. There may not be an active task group uh, for a particular goal if there's not a project uh, going on with volunteers associated. Um, and the task groups are very grassroots driven. Um, any resident, anyone with an idea can bring it to an existing task group or to the standing committee. Um, and uh, you know, obviously, if it's intended to further um, our, our efforts to live up to our very ambitious town goals, um, then we can talk about it. And it could be a new committee as part of an existing task group, or we could revitalize a task group that isn't currently active. So that's sort of the model of Vision 2020. Um, the proposal tonight is really uh, very simple. We want to simplify the standing committee and add just a little flexibility. Um, the standing committee has a two primary and fairly distinct functions. As I mentioned, it manages that uh, sort of vision and strategy part where we have the task groups and resident ideas um, connecting with the town leaders and elected officials. Um, that's sort of that vision part, and that's the heart of it. But there's also the day-to-day -day part of just running a committee. We have to manage our budgets and plan our town day booths. Um, and it's difficult to have all the same people in the room doing all of those same things. Um, and so our plan is to simply divide the existing standing committee into two parts that recognizes the two different kinds of work that we do and it should just make things um, a little easier to manage. I also think it will make it easier for people to join the standing committee because it will be a little simpler. It will resemble a lot of other town committees. It will have an at-large membership of nine people and it will have the traditional rotating three-year terms. Um, and, and I just think it's important um, that we um, sort of simplify and, and make it easier for people um, to join. The, um, the part that really changes from the current model is, um, as I said, we're going to all at large. There are two at large positions now and a number of positions that are specified for representatives um, to come up from the task groups. Um, the problem is that if, as I mentioned, since not all the task groups are f active at any one time, there's sort of gaps and vacancies on the committee and it's sort of an unpredictable size. Um, so our recommendation is to, um, to simplify, have a clear predictable committee, fewer requirements for membership, um, and I, I hope you will support it. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Priscilla. Does anyone wish to speak to this issue? Okay, we have the recommended vote of the Board of Selectmen to reorganize Vision 2020. Well, it's been, well, you don't have to second it. You, do you wish to speak to this, Mr. Hainer? No. Are you ready, Mr. Uh, Renault? <coughs> Who wants to speak to it? Oh, Mr. Wharton does? Go ahead. Do you want to speak to it, Mr. Wharton? Yeah. Yes, uh, John Wharton, Precinct 8. Uh, just, uh, this is a bylaw change that needs to be approved by the Attorney General. And um, in Section C, 
uh, here it says that all these people are supposed to be appointed before July 1, 2015. Uh, um, anyone who's been involved in this knows the Attorney General has never in recorded history approved one of our bylaws that quickly, except the thing doing away with the snowblowers. <laughs> I know where you were on that. So I, I, just, I, I just wonder how practical it is to have that kind of language in there. I've never seen it in another bylaw. Thank you. Oh. You want to amend it, Doug? Oh, okay. No. Nope. Well, we hope it happens by then. You ready, Mr. Morneau? All right, all in favor of the change? Please vote one. If you're against it, please vote two. So go ahead and vote. One hundred seventy-eight. The affirmative. Two in the negative. It's affirmative vote, and I so declare it. The committee has been changed. That and closes Article Twelve. Brings us to Article Thirteen. Ms. Mahan. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Diane Mahan. Um, basically, what this is, and it's on page eleven of the Selectman's report. Um, through, through due diligence, it became apparent to us that uh, the town owned twelve oh seven Mass Ave, the former DAV site. Um, so what the Board of Selectmen, along with the town manager, did was we established a working group in terms of what we could possibly do. Three options presented themselves. Um, the Board of Selectmen um, toured the site as well as held public meetings. Um, we did look into, there were suggestions that maybe this should be food pantry or another town office up there, but because of the site and its condition and other capital improvements and what would need to be done here, that just wasn't feasible. So at this time, the board is asking town meeting to authorize a future sale, and the last paragraph on page 12 out outlines the different um, caveats under Mass General Law, um, as well as the fact that the town would have the first right of refusal in the event the purchaser, purchaser later decides to sell. But one of the things we did hear from the hearings were different individual groups, um, educational, um, nonprofit small business said in the interim if the board would look at a possible short-term leasing um, possibility, recognizing that this would take um, the better part of a year or more to actually uh, come about. And some have suggested that if there were short-term leasers in there, it might help us um, place some sort of value to the land property if, we, if you do authorize us to begin the steps to sell it. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Um, the Harrington. Stephen Harrington, Precinct 13. Um, Mr. Moderator, I think that earlier in this meeting we um, did the capital budget and the proceeds from this sale were going to go into the capital budget. And if I recall, it was a $750,000 estimate on, um, or budget actually, they budgeted that this would bring $750,000. Um, I think that's true, so unless someone in FinCom wants to say there's Mr. a different um, number. Mr. Chapdelaine's going to address it. Adam Chapdelaine, town manager. That $750,000 is projected for FY17, so it's part of the capital plan, but not in the FY16 adopted capital budget. Okay, thank you for that clarification. So uh, the assessment on it is $348,000. So, yeah, 750 is a stretch. Um, it's also, you know, I'm a little bit, you know, worried that this right of first refusal. Um, Mr. Moderator, uh, what would trigger us to, you know, I don't know, have to, you know, to, to take this right of first refusal um, for an asset, you know, that's currently full and fair market value of $350,000, but the town seems to be thinking they're going to get seven fifty dollars for. Um, are we just looking at something that is unreason you know, unrealistic. I mean, that right of first refusal, I'd like to have someone sort of explain that to me, please. Well, right now we're just, uh, I understand we're just authorizing it, but Mr. Hank, Heim, Doug Heim, can you address it? Hmm? 
Mr. Heim is going to address your right of first refusal. So it's uh, Doug Heim, Town Council. It's just one possibility of the type of restriction that we could put on the sale so that if, say, the property were purchased um, by a buyer after a competitive bid process that wanted to use it for a purpose that the town thought was uh, a worthy uh, pursuit um, and then later turned around and tried to sell it to s someone that we were really concerned about what they might be using it for, that's why we would exercise the right of re first refusal. Now, whether well, after the initial sale? After the initial sale, yeah. Oh, so you're going to have like a deed covenant? Kind of like that, yes. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Mr. Hanner. Thank you, Mr. Moderator, Bill Hanner, Precinct 2. The, um, my concern of, about a short-term lease, uh, my understanding was that part of the idea of the capital planning is some of this money might be used to offset uh, one of the school projects that's up, up and coming. Uh, I'm just concerned that how, how much of a short-term lease and somebody could, somebody could address that. Ms. Mahan's going to address that. Um, from my memory from the, when we had the hearings, um, it was anticipated this would take a little bit over a year. 12, 15 months possibly. And from that hearing, the individuals who got up, including one of the groups from the high school, and I can't think of their name, but they've been very active with issues bef before the Board of Selectmen, said that perhaps since it's as, as much as 12 to 15 months out, that at least one six month lease be considered for one use or others, and then we would address it again if we decided to do it one more time, depending on how, if tell me authorizes us to put this out to for sale. My only concern is that uh, the capital planning and uh, the people have worked very hard to put a, uh, a financial package together for Stratton's uh, program, and I just don't want us to all of a sudden find out that we, we're landlords instead of having the money to pay for it. That's all. Thank okay, you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Mr. Schlickman? Paul Schleckman, Precinct 9. I rise in support of the article, but I have a question. Uh, it it's been mentioned on a couple of occasions that we all of a sudden discovered that we own this. I'm just sort of wondering how it happens that we all of a sudden discover that we own this property. <laughs> Mr. Chapdelaine. Town, uh, Adam Chapdelaine, Town Manager. I was waiting for that question. <laughs> Uh, uh, <clears throat> basically, through um, uh, a, a compliance check of the, of the uh, property's liquor license when it was operating as the Disabled American Veterans Club, uh, uh, when the board was looking into the enforcement uh, of a potential violation of the liquor license, it became clear that the owner of the property was the town through the Board of Selectmen. <laughs> How long has that been? Uh, I, I want to say it was in the 1920s through a tax taking. 1926. <laughs> Okay. Uh. <laughs> well, good job finding it. Yeah, I got the end. Um, Mr. Fuller? Uh, Peter Fuller, Precinct 20. Uh, in the same vein of some previous questions, the selectman's commentary says an approximately 7,000 square foot developed parcel. I looked at the assessor's records, they have it listed as 4,645 square feet. Who's correct? Well, the guy who found it's gonna tell us. Adam Chapdelaine, town manager. Uh, I can't speak to the assessor's records, but I know from the appraisal that was performed, the uh, lot size and the building takes up almost the entire lot is about 7,000 square feet. Okay, I hope the uh, takeaway from this is that the town manager and his staff do a complete survey of what the town owns and, and how much it's valued at and how big the area is so we know what we're dealing with. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Ms. Mamone? Okay, Zarina Memon, Precinct 21. 
Um, I want to know, since uh, we just found out about this building um, in 2014, um, so there's no rent that was being collected um, from this precision um, tire and alignment? No, there was, there was no rent. It was the DAV. I think they get would have gotten veteran services free rent, even if they were there. I guess we never collected rent from them, even though we could have. Oh, well. I don't think it's just a vote for veterans. I think it's the precision tire and auto um, alignment. No, it's, it's just a veterans building, it's just DAV. It's a veterans building? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Oh, I thought it was more. Okay. Um, and then uh, is this going to still, was this the veterans facility considered business, and is it going to stay a business later when, when we uh, sell it uh, after this first fusel and so forth? I, I didn't quite get the question. Could you repeat for me? I want to know, the, uh, is the zoning on this going to be a business property, um, or will that status change? Adam, but Carol. Adam Chapdelaine, town manager. There's no contemplated uh, or proposed change to the zoning. And Carol, you can correct me, but I believe it's neighborhood business zoned right now. Business district. Yeah. And, and the lease that's pro being proposed by Ms. Mahan um, for six months, uh, what kind of a uh, price are you thinking about for um, renting? Ms. Mahan? Um, we haven't even um, established that as of yet. Right now, what we're doing is we want to put forth before town meeting um, that we are requesting the sale of it. Um, future steps that we will take, but we haven't gone any further into that because we didn't want to be presumptuous um, in terms of how town meeting voted. So, and what I would do is I would rely on the town, man my colleagues and I would rely on the right. town manager and, and others so in terms of. We are sort of leaning towards selling versus renting it, even though we're thinking of a six term. We're six recommending month. sale, disposition okay. is sale. And the, the selling price, I mean, I know Sean Harrington asked, uh, was it assessed at 348 and we're thinking about selling it for 750? And I really have an objection to selling. I think we could collect more money by renting. I, th it's a, I think we, I know we're always short of money, but I think it would be a logical thing is to collect the rent. I mean, Monopoly was a great game for me. I love that game. I would say just myself personally, if this was prime, up to date, completely up to code, HVAC, condition of floor, roof, drainage, um, if we had that kind of pristine building, perhaps that would have been considered more but we did do a feasibility study of what the, um, the former DAV, 1207 Mass Ave, what condition it's in, and it's just not cost feasible. And I don't know who we would, get. as soon as somebody came in, it's not handicap accessible, it, there's so many things, so. Oh, okay. So the data on this, the feasibility is on the website somewhere, or uh, where can we look at that? What I would anticipate is following town meetings vote, if, if you all agree, oh, okay. that we do put this out for sale. Okay, but we um, don't the, have the numbers on the feasibility. Right, no, the town manager would have to, oh, his okay. department has Maybe worked through that. Maybe the town manager could answer some of the questions on uh, improving this property for rental. You would put it out to bid? Do you have a specific question you want me to Yeah, address? I want to know, um, Ms. Mahan just said that this property needs considerable work in order to be renovated to be up to code, and I want to know how much, since there was a feasibility study done on this, uh, how much, what, 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 are you look, what numbers are you looking at? So I, I believe, Ms., uh, excuse me, <coughs> Adam Chaplain, town manager, I believe Ms. Mahan was referring to the uh, appraisal, which at this point uh, is a confidential document as not wanting to uh, prejudice what the bidding price might actually be or what someone might bid on uh, a potential sale of the parcel. Uh, but after assessing it with our building department, uh, having some folks, uh, the entire board of selectmen and some other folks from key committees in town tour, uh, it became very clear that there was a substantial investment to be made. And I'll stand here myself and say I'm of the opinion that the town is a landlord for some buildings and there's actually a rental properties budget contained within the finance committee report, but I don't think that continuing to be a landlord for uh, additional buildings than we currently are supporting is, uh, is the appropriate step for the town to take. And why do you say that? I'm just um, not understanding what you're saying because improvements are too burdensome or it's a too big of a burden? I, I, I generally don't feel that town government outside of what it currently is supporting is well equipped to be a landlord. Okay. All right. Thanks. Done. And on Precinct 21, uh, in response to Mr. Schlickman's questions and some of the other following ones, 
Um, I will say that when I got the phone call from the then town council that said, by the way, you own the building, it was one of the most surprising phone calls that I've received since I was elected as a selectman. And we did indeed, um, after that, launch a search of everything in the town records and in the assessor's database to find out and make sure that there wasn't anything else that was like this and lost. <laughs> And uh, we didn't find anything. And so as spectacular as it is that uh, you know, the town owned the DAV for tw since the mid-20s and didn't really remember, um, I, don't, I don't think that there's anything. I, I believe that we've covered everything we can to prove that, that isn't, there isn't anything else waiting to surprise us in the future. Mr. Swilling. Nathan Swilling, Precinct 4. I move to terminate debate. Motion to terminate debate. All in favor, please say yes. Yes. Opposed? No. It's a two-thirds vote, and I saw to clear it. Okay, we now have before us a recommended vote of the Board of Selectmen to authorize to dispose of the property. This requires a two-thirds vote. So we're going to use our clicker as soon as Mr. Renault is ready. So one, yes, you're going to authorize them. Two, no, you want to keep the piece of property. And go ahead and vote. Yeah. Yes, it's two thirds. Okay, we have 184 in the affirmative, 11 in the negative. It's pat it is a two-thirds vote, I so declare. And that closes Article 13. That brings us to Article 14. Um, recommend a vote of selectment of no action. All in favor of no action, please say yes. Yes. Opposed? It is a no action vote, and I so declare it. That brings us, closes Article 14, brings us to Article 15. We have... Home Rule, Board of Assessors change. Recommend a vote of the selectmen for no action. No, you don't have to speak to no action. Mr. Um, Howard. Uh, Peter Howard, Precinct 10. Uh, I'd like to invite uh, Chris Loretti, who is the originator of this article, to speak to the town meeting. I think you have to introduce your motion first and get it seconded before we can invite anyone to speak on it because it's still technically no action. The uh, motion, motion has been handed out uh, several nights ago. There are extra copies in the back of the room. Okay, there you go. So we have a motion before us, and Ms. Loretti is going to come speak to it. Thank you, Mr. Howard. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Chris Loretti, 56 Adams Street. I'd like to also thank Mr. Howard and thank Town Council for his professional input in guiding me on the legal niceties in this motion to ensure that it will pass muster with, its st with the state should it pass town meeting. Because many people in town seem to be prone to finding personal agendas and warrant articles where none exist, I want to make it clear to Mr. Tierney, the Director of, Ass of Assessments and everyone present, that this article is not about him or his staff or anyone else. Last August, after the Board of Assessors debacle in removing our last assessor and its failed attempt to hire one of its own as a replacement, I wrote an op-ed piece in the Arlington Advocate describing the need to professionalize Arlington's Board of Assessors and noted that I'd be submitting a warrant article to that effect. I described the two recommendations in the 2012 State Department of Revenue report on the town's financial organization that pertained to the Board of Assessors. And one of those recommendations was to make, to change the hiring of the board, the, uh, it was to change the hiring of the Director of Assessments from a political appointment of the Board of Assessors to a professional appointment of the town manager. I'm here tonight to ask you to implement that recommendation by approving this home rule legislation. And I ask you to do that for four reasons. First, as the Department of Revenue points out, the Board of Assessors has very little policy discretion today because its actions are largely dictated by state law. Where it does has po have policy discretion, such as granting abatements and exemptions, that will continue. The Board will continue to do that. It will continue to be elected. We have working models for how this works in town. The 
Town's Planning Board, the ARB, is supported by a professional planning department hired by the town manager. The same occurs with the Parks and Recreation um, Department and the Parks and Recreation Commission. This, there's also working models in other towns. Needham changed to having a, an elected board of assessors with a professional um, director of assessments hired by the town manager about 10 years ago. I spoke to that man today, a uh, gentleman named Mr. Davis. He's been in the assessment office in Needham for 22 years. He said it works fine there. There's no tension between the manager and the board. And he was actually surprised that in a town like Arlington, as large as it is, that we have a professional assessing staff that's overseen by a part-time board of assessors that only meets once or twice a month. Second reason for supporting this article is that the town should have the largest possible pool of candidates to hire when it, when it advertises for the position of, of director of assessments. That didn't happen last year. The first time they tried, only 14 people applied. The second time, only six. Compare that to some of the other recent hires in town. 42 applications for the town council, 43 for the planning director, 81 for the deputy town manager. So what's the problem here in Arlington? Clearly it's not salary. The salary survey the town did last year indicated that our board of director of assessments is more highly paid than any of the other uh, 12 peer communities. Six applicants, most with limited experience, is not what I would call a successful hiring process. Clearly, more people would rather work for a professional town manager than for politicians. And honestly, if you were in their position, wouldn't you feel the same way? The third reason to support this article is to is to promote greater transparency and accuracy in the assessment process. Groups like the Vision 2020 Fiscal Resources Group wouldn't, shouldn't have to go to the Board of Selectmen to complain about not getting the assessment data they want. And I don't think that would happen if the town manager was in charge of the operations. I also believe it's more likely for the town to have greater, uh, to have the problem of underassessed commercial properties addressed if the town manager was the person doing the hiring of the director of assessments. The fourth reason to support this article is that I believe town meeting should trust and support its town manager. While you won't note it or notice it reading the Board of Selectmen's report, the town manager states that he supports this change on its merits, even though he might prefer that all of the changes in the DOR report be implemented at once. I think we need to be realistic. All of the change in the DOR report are not going to be implemented at the same time because of the reluctance of the town to change from elected to appointed positions. That's not an issue in this case. Individual recommendations in the DOR report already have begun to be implemented. Clearly, they don't all need to be done at the same time. I would also note that when the selectmen first held their hearing on this article, the Board of Assessors didn't appear, they didn't respond to the Board of Selectmen's request for comment. It was only after they were invited back that they expressed their opposition to this article. And it seems to me the Selectmen are asking you to vote no because they want to keep in good stead with the Board of Assessors. As town meeting members, you can show leadership even when the Board of Selectmen is afraid to. You can do what be is, be is best for the town even if it does hurt some people's feelings. Please don't let the Selectmen control the conversation on this motion. Ask the town manager directly how he feels about this proposed change. If you have any questions or concerns about how he might implement them, ask him. That's what he's here for. I believe you owe that to yourselves. You owe it to him, and you owe it to the town. I'm confident that if you listen to the town manager's perspective, you, like the State Department of Revenue, will conclude that this change will benefit the town, even if it is implemented on its own. Thank you. Ms. Mahan, thank you, sir. Ms. Mahan. Thank you, Mr. Moderator Diane Mahan, town meeting member, precinct 14 also. Um, basically, Mr. Loretti encapsulated most of what I would say, so I'll, I'll make this really brief. There were 15 DOR recommendations. These are two of them that were contained therein. Um, we did have the hearing that night with the proponent there. One of the things that my colleagues and myself felt was very important is to ask the Board of Assessors if they could come to our next meeting because we'd be interested um, in that elected body since it would be uh, so affected. Um, they did come in and indicated that they weren't in favor of this. Um, and basically the Board had discussion that there were 15 recommendations by Mass MassDOR. 
um, and to do it piecemeal and to also not do it with that spirit of cooperation might set up some adversarial roles. Um, the board has taken um, one of the 15 recommendations um, regarding the um, comptroller uh, job responsibilities and taken the recommendation contained in the Mass DOR report and implemented that. And I think, uh, speaking for myself, what we wanted to do was move forward on the Mass DOR recommendations in the spirit of cooperation. And we really look to um, the Board of Assessors for their opinion, since this is something they deal with in terms of supervising as well as hiring uh, the Director of Assessments. And I do know that Mr. Feely, one of the members of the Board of Assessors, is here tonight if you have any questions that relate to their um, opinions. Mr. Feely. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. I'm Kevin Feely, member of the Board of Assessors and representing the board uh, this evening. Uh, first of all, I'd like to explain that we didn't make the original meeting that the selectmen had established because we had already posted a public meeting, which included hearings of the assessing department, and we also had a budget meeting uh, dealing with the Warren articles that will come up later in the budget. Um, we did go to the second meeting and, and put our thoughts uh, forward. Uh, we, we agree with the position of the assessors that the director of assessing should be appointed uh, by the board of assessors. Um, I know Mr. Loretti offered a few examples. He didn't seem to offer the example that the town manager is, is, is hired by the board of selectmen. How would it be if, if, if some other hiring body hired the town manager and yet he reported to the board of selectmen? Same thing with the superintendent of schools. Um, it, the, the report which was commissioned by the town manager and the superintendent of schools ostensibly was to deal with the one and a half million dollar overspending by the school committee. The board of assessors and the assessing office have nothing to do with spending at all. So lo and behold, out of that report comes a recommendation dealing with the assessing department, which had nothing to do with the scope of the study at all. It is uh, two things. This is a home rule petition. State law will still require that the director of assessing be hired by the board and be responsible by the board, and that, because that's in the general laws. Maybe Mr. Hine has a little different opinion on that, but that my opinion is that the, the, even the home rule position will not override the general law unless it amends the general law. Um, we feel that the system is working well. The direct assessing uh, provides all the information that the treasurer, that the finance committee, that the town manager need. He, is, he attends all of the major meetings of the, at the town hall and works cooperatively uh, with, with all the other town employees. The, 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 the old adage that a person cannot answer to two masters, that this it makes no sense to have the hiring authority and the firing authority in one person and the responsibility in the, in the other part of the responsibility put on the board by state law and, and state regulation. So we respectfully ask the town meeting to uh, vote against the, the purported amendment. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Mr. Jameson. Um, thank you, Mr. Moderator Gordon Jameson, Precinct 12. Um, and I am co-chair of the Vision 2020 Fiscal Resource Task Group, but I, th I think I'm speaking as my own person. I just want to give that as reference because our group has been, and I, have been involved in these types of discussions. Um, before I even joined that group, um, Mr. Reedy was involved in the group, and um, the, that group surveyed a variety of towns looking at how we might change the financial organization of our town. Um, we did that again and put forth an article that um, the selectmen made a committee, as some of you may remember. Eventually, that was rotated or transformed into something that town meetings uh, uh, had done. Um, a report was given by Mr. Sullivan 
of options. And by that time, Mr. Chapdelaine um, was at the reins of town manager. And uh, owing to the fact that there was one strong, very strong contingent an elected, um, related to an, an elected person in the town, um, an elected office in the town, that did not go forward. I was disappointed by that. Um, I mean no ill will towards anyone elected, non-elected, appointed, um, employed by the town or otherwise. Um, I want our town to have the best financial organization possible. Um, I think I might have signed the, the article here only to make sure that it came before town meeting. Um, I was, I was uh, of mixed thoughts about this. Um, in some ways, I think doing it all would be the best way. But Mr. Loretti, I think, gave a very cogent discussion tonight. One of the best ever, um, Chris, you would be commended tonight. Um, thoughtful, logical, and um, I'm, I'm gonna support this motion and as a first step. Um, we could change it back if we decide it doesn't work, but somehow we have to figure out to operate like most the other towns of this size around us. And it's, it's essentially all of them operate with a professional financial management team like a business. We are now a $160 million business. Um, I think we need to operate that way, and so I'm going to vote for this. And I urge you to do the same. Thank you much, very much, Mr. Moderator. Thank you, sir. Mr. Stephen Harrington. Stephen Harrington, Precinct 13. Um, I, I've, I rise to support this motion as well. Um, just to you know, um, respond to uh, some of the gentlemen earlier this evening. Um, as far as state law is concerned, you know, obviously Mr. Heim could speak to it, but we don't need to. Needham does it. Needham found a way. Arlington can find a way. Um, in terms of the concern that you're going to have two masters, you know, uh, between you know the you know board of selectmen who controls the town manager and the board of assessors, we've already seen uh, it's very collaborative. Uh, they fit hand in glove, and they don't. The board had to be concerned with, you know, some friction between two elected boards. We don't have to worry about that. We're all done at the end of, um, you know, May. Um, so there's, uh, you know, it's a legitimate concern that they want to be able to work together well. Um, that's where we come in and tell them, well, you know, we think we can do it a better way. And so um, there's really no reason not to do this. Um, I haven't heard any reason that sounds, you know, for, to not do it. And there's plenty of reason to do it. If you, um, if you spent the time and looked through the meeting minutes like I have, about one third of the time of the Board of Assessors is spent on personnel matters. Uh, it took them three months to decide to buy back vacation time and sick time. And it's not that it took them that long to decide, it's just that they don't meet that often, and, and they're a volunteer group, right? They're, well, they're paid a small stipend, elected, but they're not really, you know, day-to-day -day management. And um, I'm sure that the town manager has policies and procedures in place to handle all of these issues. He doesn't have to wait until they meet again in a month. And so um, you want to have employees have professional management, that if, if you have an issue with an employee, if you want to get, say, a database of assessments in town, well, you know, if the director of assessments doesn't have the resources to do it because, well, he's not an IT department, um, you know, it's better if he's in an organization that has all one person who can set priorities. And I think that's the town manager again. And if he, you know, for some reason you're not satisfied, you don't have to wait to go in front of an elected board um, that's going to act on maybe a popularity issue. You can go instead to a professional town manager and say, hey, look at do this, or I'm writing a letter to the editor. And, you know, he'd probably do it anyhow. We wouldn't even have to get that far. So I think that it's important that there's no reason against doing this. I think there's a lot of good reasons to do it. You could look at the past in a lot of the positions, um, we lost a library director recently because of some, well, I'm not even sure, but it sounded like friction with, the, with some of the um, a board. 
Um, and we've also, you know, had issues with uh, this office with, you know, several sort of um, directors of assessors in a short period of time. So I would say that, you know, uh, please go with me, vote on this. It's nothing personal. It's really just seeing a problem and seeing a really simple solution. Thank you. Mr. Oster. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. I'm Adam Oster from uh, Precinct 3, and I'm wondering if someone can tell me um, how many people work in the personnel department and how much we pay them every year. In the personnel department? Don't we have a personnel department in, in Arlington? Yeah, we're talking about the assessors now. But Adam, can you answer that question? You can answer it? Oh, Adam Chapter okay. Lane, Town Manager. The Personnel or Human Resources Department has uh, three and a half head count, and I just want to give you the accurate personnel services. And the salaries uh, and human resources uh, for this year are just uh, short of $260,000. Thank you. Um, this vote is about what will happen the next time there is a vacancy in the job position of uh, Director of Assessors. Uh, it's not about anything that happened. Um, it's about something that I hope won't happen for a while. Uh, will happen at a time when we don't even know who will be uh, on the Board of Assessors. Um, but it's for a position that is a professional managerial role that involves a high degree of expertise. The change would uh, turn that decision over to a professional staff uh, who handled these matters routinely and the salaries of whom we already pay for in our taxes. Uh, I have learned from watching uh, the town that personal matters can be fraught. The town has run into some problems with hirings and firings and there have been a few situations when we really would have benefited by having a professional involved in the hiring process. When I come to town meeting, uh, I often feel at a disadvantage because I'm just here part-time. Um, I'm not in the trenches with a lot of people who meet year-round and deal with the fiscal stuff and hear from a lot more people than I do. Uh, and I kind of just have to try to figure out, based on the information that I'm given, what the best course of action is. And like a lot of you, I end up voting yes on things that are recommended to vote yes. Um, with this article, I feel that our distance is a virtue because we can make this decision based not on the day-to-day -day stuff, not on the personalities, but by asking really what is best for Arlington, what makes sense for the town. Um, that's why I'm voting yes. Uh, whatever you decide, I invite you to make the decision based on what's best for the town as well. Thank you, sir. Mr. Harris. E.J. Harris, Precinct 5. Um, we heard, Mr. Moderator, that there were no good reasons to oppose this. Um, and as you can imagine, I was willing to accept that challenge. I have four. Um, the first is, um, I, I think the first sort of major area that I, that I would identify is uh, political oversight. Um, we elect the assessors specifically because we see a public policy interest in the assessing department, right? I think historically that's why we do that. Um, so in as much as we believe that there is important policy oversight over the assessors, I think the fact that the town actually deposits, but depo like uses, exercises their sovereignty to deposit authority with them suggests that they ought to be deferred to in uh, exercising the, the, the policy preferences um, that, that they enact. Um, the second is, he, specifically one of the prior speakers talked about letters to the editor, um, and I've on the, on the floor the other night talked about um, town meeting speeches as, as a way of redressing grievances. Um, it turns out that the way you get 
the, the reason that people care about letters to the editor and people care about town meeting speeches as a way of assessing grievances is because those people are elected, because they want the people who read the advocate to vote for them. Um, I, I, I like the town manager a lot. We don't vote for him. Um, he may respond to letters to the editor. He may not. He's under no realistic obligation to do so. Um, the third is, I think, probably the most important and why I'm going to ditch the fourth. But um, the qu I, I think it is true what the prior speaker said, that town meeting is, it turns out, a fairly deferential body. Um, and I think part of the question here is, to whom are we going to defer? Um, it seems to me that if we are going to defer to someone on this issue, it is best to defer um, to the people that the town has chosen, the people who elected us have chosen, uh, to exercise policy preferences in this matter. They clearly believe that this is problematic. Uh, the selectmen whom we all elected believe it's problematic. Uh, I think if we are going to be as deferential a body as we habitually are, um, it behooves us to defer to the people that the town elected to exercise these questions. Um, generally, though, I think there is also a problem um, at accumulating all of these policy concerns in an unelected town manager, right? Part of why we have elected bodies like this one and many others uh, is in order to segregate those concerns. Um, we don't let, even though he sort of is ultimately involved in, in, in selecting a lot of town departments, um, I think the reason we do town elections the way we do um, is to enact uh, policy preferences uh, without him sometimes, or when there's a conflict so that the people the voters chose win out over somebody that they didn't. Because of that, I actually think there are a lot of reasons why we shouldn't do this um, without a, 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 a more robust um, overall plan for implementing the DOR uh, review and for figuring out what, like, what do we want the assessors to do? What do we want all of these bodies to do? I think without a clear vision of that, um, this is a premature step at the very least, and so I'd urge you to oppose. Thank you, sir. John, Harrington. Not in the room. Scott Smith. Scott Smith, Precinct 5, move the question. All matters. We have a motion to terminate debate on all issues before us under the article. All in favor, please say yes. Yes. Opposed? My opinion is a two-third vote. We have before us a um, recommended vote of the Board of Selectmen, and we have Mr. Peter Howard's amendment or substitute motion. First, we're going to vote on Mr. Howard's substitute motion. As soon as Mr. Monroe is ready. So one, yes, I want the substitute motion. Two, no, I do not want it. So go ahead and vote. Two is a no vote, one is a yes vote. One yes, two no. Yes is 104. No is 73. So now we have the recommended vote of the Board of Selectmen as substituted by Mr. Howard's vote. So one, you want to change it. Two, you do not want it. So as soon as he's ready. What? One is yes, two is no. It's always the same. One, yes, we're going to change. We're going to ask them. No, I'm clarifying. One, yes, we want them to submit the thing we are voting to submit the home rule legislation, whatever the heck it's asking us to do, to no, you do not want to change anything. Yeah, as soon as you're ready. So one, yes, you want to submit this, two, you do not want to.
116 in the affirmative, 76 in the negative. It is an affirmative vote, and I so declare it. So, not, not, none of that. We're not, what was it, 116 to 76. That closes Article 15 and brings us to Article 16. Acceptance of legislation, complete streets. Ms. Mahan, nope. Anyone want to present to complete streets? Anyone want to speak to complete streets? Mr. Smith. First we have Mr. Trembley. Oh, Ms. Mahan's going to speak to it first. Okay. Okay. I'm Diane Mahan, Vice Chair. I'm on page 14 of the Selectman's Report. There's a very detailed you got to speak right into the mic, Diane. Sorry about that. On page 14 of the Selectman's Report, there's a very detailed explanation about this program. Basically, this authorizes us to apply for the funding for Complete Streets. I, and I think the town manager would address this better. Adam Chapdelain, town manager. Uh, the vote before the body tonight is to adopt the Complete Streets statute. What that would mean is it's the first step in Arlington committing to becoming a complete streets community. After that, uh, the town, through the Board of Selectmen, would need to adopt a complete streets policy. Following that, um, the town would then need to um, commit to actually following and complying with that complete streets policy, and would also need to adopt a municipal mode shift or a mode share goal. Uh, what that basically means is committing to shifting people from one mode, say vehicular travel, to another mode, walking, bicycling, using transit. And ultimately, by uh, adopting uh, this section of law tonight, and then adopting a complete streets policy, and complying with the rest of the statute, the town would then eventually qualify for state funding to then implement a complete streets project. Uh, generally, a complete streets project uh, would entail taking a look at a roadway and looking at all users, looking at the motor vehicle travel lanes, looking at bicycle lanes, looking at pedestrians, uh, and also looking at transit uses and building what would be called a complete street. Um, during the selectman's hearing, um, uh, a proponent of this article used this comparison, and it's a comparison I've used as well. Uh, this is not dissimilar from the Green Communities Grant Program, where the town committed to a number of criteria to become qualified as a green community, and then once qualified as a green community, eligible for grant funding. Again, this would be similar. The town would commit to a number of criteria uh, to become a complete streets community, per se, and then, uh, if meeting those criteria, qualify for grant funding to implement a complete streets project. Thanks. Mr. Trembley. At Trembley, Precinct 19. So uh, what is complete streets? We've heard how it makes the streets friendly for all users, pedestrians, bikes, motorcyclists. Really? Arlington's been doing what complete streets calls for for some night, time now. And I can't think of any realigned intersection, newly installed island, or bump out that's been motorist friendly. For example, the intersection of Forest and Summer Street, and along with the Summer and uh, Overlook intersection, hasn't worked out too well. When I pass on, they can put on my obituary that Ed Trembley spent three months of his life sitting at the Summer, uh, Forest Street traffic light. Uh, the Summer Street Islands, they're car killers. Um, the town is already striping roads for bike lanes, adding bump outs, crosswalks, and you know, pedestrian safety is an issue, but if you go look at the, the uh, Complete Streets websites, what actually might improve uh, pedestrian safety, namely pedestrian activated crosswalk illumination so that you can see a pedestrian at night or know when the crosswalk is occupied, they don't talk about that. So it's not about pedestrian safety or bike lanes or anything like that. We're already doing that. It's, and it's definitely not about traffic improvement because the more complete street type improvements we add, the worse traffic gets. So what is it about? Well, one answer came from a town official I talked to. It's a no-brainer. It's free money. Really? There's no such thing as free money. If, if it's free money comes from the state, 
which pocket does it come from, this one or that one? And if it's from the Freds, well, it's monopoly money. If the Feds don't shut off the printing presses, um, we're gonna be in deep trouble. We, we're living beyond our means on credit cards. We've been doing that for a long time. So I don't think that we should be taking federal money to do stuff that um, is que of questionable value. But I also think there's an, another more sinister reason. A few, go a few years ago, a guy from the Metropolitan Planning Council, and I don't know who died and made the Metropolitan uh, Planning Council the arbiter of all, all roadway projects, but nothing gets approved without them giving it the okay. So a few years ago, this guy from the Metropolitan Planning Council was standing right here at this podium, this one, uh, at the Mass Ave, uh, while well, we were discussing the Mass Ave project, and he was getting pressed pretty hard about, uh, by the, the opponents to it who were concerned about uh, traffic flows and all that stuff. And he got kind of frustrated, and in a rare display of honesty, he told us we were all gonna be riding bikes by 2030. Um, <laughs> so fast forward a few years. I'm on the DOT, Mass DOT Green Line uh, email the, the whole Green Line extension email thing. And so anybody who, in this body here who's also on that email thing got the same one I did. And it informed me that by 2030, 30% 30 of us were gonna be riding bicycles. Well, when I hear essentially the same thing from two different state agencies with the same dates, it kind of gets my attention. It's pretty obvious to me that the goal of complete streets is to screw up traffic so bad that we all choose to get out of our cars and ride bicycles. And I don't know about you, but you know, the, my work van has a few thousand pounds of tools on it. I'm not using a bicycle for that. And I'm also, when I'm in 2030, I'll be what, 73 or something? I'm not riding a bicycle to stop and shop to go shopping in the middle of the winter. Um, now, don't misunderstand me. I, I'm, a, I'm a, like a freedom guy. And I think people should have the freedom to take whatever form of transportation they want. If they want to walk, take bikes, great. But I also don't think that we should be supporting policies that use our tax dollars to screw up traffic and make it difficult for us to get from one place to another. It's, it's kind of a freedom thing for me. And I don't think that the federal government has, we, we should be supporting anything that limits our freedom to go and do whatever we want. So please join me in voting no on this. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Scott Smith. Yes. Scott Smith, Precinct 5. Uh, do you have him? OK. I've uh, been asked, uh, you may know, I'm also a member of the Transportation Advisory Committee and Bike Advisory Committee. I've been asked a couple of times just what is a complete street. So I'll just read the definition off the master plan. Complete streets are designed and operated to provide safety and access for all users of the roadway, including pedestrians, bicyclists, transit riders, motorists, commercial vehicles, and community safety vehicles and for people of all ages and abilities. So uh, like the previous speaker, for me it's also a matter of freedom. And, and I'll just offer two slides to give some examples. Uh, uh, can you back up one, please? Thank you. Yes, uh, sorry, it's hard to see. Um, so I just went on the Google Maps, found a few streets around this area, which I think all would agree. One complete street. This is Beacon Street and Brookline leading into Coolidge Corner, recently redone. Uh, got the green line over to the left, got transit, works fine for driving. I drive down there and visit friends all the time. Uh, has a bike lane in parts, shared lanes in other parts, good sidewalks, good curb ramps, uh, directions to parking. It's covering, serving everyone. Next slide, please. Right. Example, not a complete street. Mall Road, Burlington. <laughs> Try being a pedestrian there. <laughs> Try. Uh, is, this is the uh, 
Route 350 bus stop by the Burlington Mall. No sidewalk, no pedestrian crossing. I used to work up that way and it was so dangerous walking there, I did not have the freedom to use transit. I had to drive, adding to traffic in Arlington because the pedestrian environment up in that area was just too dangerous. So, uh, but this is not what Arlington's gonna do. As the previous speaker pointed out, uh, we are trying to look out for pedestrians, especially in all of our projects. So this is not a major change in policy. What it does do is open up a potential new source of funding for projects like improving our sidewalks, some other roadway projects, things that we desperately need to do and really don't have enough money to do right now to our satisfaction. Please join me in supporting this. Thank you, sir. Ms. LaCourt. Annie LaCourt, Precinct 15. Um, I also rise in support of this article, I'm violating my own rule for the second time this season by not asking a question. Um, I believe that um, w when we began town meeting and Kevin Greeley asked us the question of what do we think the problem is going to be 50 years from now, I think that the response, at least to the most people around me, was something along the lines of climate change, flooding in East Arlington, so on and so forth. These kinds of programs that are designed not to restrict the freedom of people to use the form of transportation they want, but to encourage alternate forms of transportation to take some pressure off traffic on the streets. And also, frankly, as a very aggressive driver, I have to tell you, to, try to calm traffic. I drive a lot slower in Arlington along those intersections in those areas that Ed just mentioned that are near my home because of the new traffic controls. Um, it sort of helps keep me in, in line would be a good way to put it. So I think that, <laughs> yeah, all right, I'm just being honest, guys. Um, so I think that it's important for us to take advantage of these kinds of programs so that we have the funding to make the kind of modifications that will make our streets friendly to all modes of transportation and that streets that are friendly to all modes of transportation are less dangerous for everyone People are less likely to get in an accident. You know, believe me, when a car hits a person on a bicycle or hits a person who's a pedestrian, the driver doesn't feel safe. The driver feels like they've done an awful thing and they're in a lot of trouble. So it's protecting everyone to do this kind of traffic calming, to provide safe um, alternatives, modes of transportation for people who are walking and biking and uh, forcing us all to share the road. And if we have some money with which to do these kinds of modifications, um, that we get without actually raising our own property taxes, I think that's an advantage to us. So I hope that you will consider voting for this article. Thank you, Mr. Deist. John Deist, Precinct 13. I, I would just like to point out that um, in the second paragraph on page 14 of the Selectman's report, it says, the recently enacted complete street statute is projected to make $50 million in street and sidewalk improvement design and construction funds available to Massachusetts municipalities. A little bit further down toward the bottom, it says, Hence, bearing in mind the success of similar, um, excuse me, uh, not there. Should the final regulations be too onerous, there will be no impact of declining to develop an internal complete streets program. So if we, if we do not adopt this, if we say no, that means that that $50 million will go to other communities to improve their streets. If we say yes, then of course the money will be available and if we decide that we don't want to do something because the restrictions are too onerous, we simply won't do it. So as far as I can see, there's no reason not to vote for this article. Thank you very much. Mike Clement.
Thank you, Tom Michaelman, Precinct 7. Mr. Moderator, could somebody answer the question, um, what exactly happens after we, if we approve this article, it goes in front of the selectmen, but then does it come back to town meeting at any point? I'm just curious. Oh, I believe once we approve it, it's the law of the land. Adam Chapdelaine, town manager. Uh, if town meeting was to adopt the statute tonight, the next step I would presume is that the Board of Selectmen would consider adopting a complete streets policy. Uh, there have not been final regulations issued uh, stemming from the statute. Should the uh, regulations then require that an actual complete streets policy be adopted town, uh, by town meeting, we'd certainly come back. Currently, it's our understanding that the Board of Selectmen would be the ones adopting that policy. So. Uh, there, there's a little bit of a, a variation in exactly what that route would be, uh, but that, that's how we see it laying out. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Fisher. Uh, Andrew Fisher, Precinct 6. Um, I just want to express agreement with Mr. Tremblay's assertion and uh, object to the way quite a bit of policy does come down from professional organizations like Metropolitan Area Planning Council. I mean, I'm not a libertarian sort, but things like we're about to receive a traffic light at uh, what used to be Steve's Pizza, where Swan Lane is. Pardon me? Your question Isn't, I'm, I'm assuming that that's an example of complete streets of the type of regulations that we'll be assuming. I don't think it's outside of the scope. Is it inside of the scope or Well, not? just keep going. We don't argue about I, scope. I just hate it when people yell scope because they don't understand what you're saying. You have to say it before, you, before they can understand. Um, so I've decided to strike back when people... Well, that's my job. Um, Your job is to keep... <laughs> proponent your point but you know what did this community ask for a traffic light so we can all stop for the 50 or so bicyclists that cross who they didn't ask for it they're crossing in good shape so I, I agree with mr. Tremblay and I'm, I'm tired of seeing us bend over backwards for funding to conform to guidelines that weren't asked for and aren't necessarily agreed to. Thank you. Yep. No, no, Sean, the guy behind you, whose name I forget. I'm sorry. My, my fault for sitting uh, behind Sean. <laughs> <laughs> Steve Revelock, Precinct 1. Um, I enjoyed seeing the two slides earlier. I've, uh, I've ride a bicycle a lot. Um, I've been down on Beacon Street in Brookline and it's a rather nice trip. I've also been on Mall Road in Burlington and it's, it's a little challenging. Um, you know, and I, 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 I with, def, with all deference to the gentleman who spoke earlier, I honestly plan to stop, be bicycling to stop and shop when I'm 73 in the middle of winter and hopefully I'll actually be able to follow up on this. Um, I do not have to, I ride to work every day. I don't have to haul a thousand pounds of equipment in a truck um, because I definitely would not try to haul a thousand pounds of equipment around on a bike. But I would argue that for those who's, you know, who need to drive um, as part of their job or et cetera, uh, you, it might be to your advantage to have more people riding bicycles. Um, but I do have a question. Yes, sir. Regarding the... As, as a cyclist, one of the things that, um, one of the, the factors to me that makes a street safe or less safe is actually the condition of the pavement. Um, so for, for example, um, you know, there was recently some paving done on the Minuteman and it's very nice to ride on. There's a section of Mass Ave right in front of City Hall that's just sort of like a little bit of a roller coaster. And I'm wondering if the, you know, a complete streets program has or does, there are elements that deal with the pavement and the quality of road surface. Can someone answer that question? 
Yeah, Adam's going to take a shot at that. Adam Chapdelaine, town manager. I, I don't believe the complete streets policy would directly speak to the condition of the pavement, but the adoption of a, the statute and then the policy and then the funding that could be coming subsequent would help us be faster at, at making some of the upgrades to pavement condition that we currently have planned. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Mr. Wagoner. Uh, Carl Wagner, Precinct 11. I move the question on all associated matters. We have a motion to terminate debate. It's been seconded. All in favor, please say yes. Yes. Opposed? No. It is a two thirds vote, and I so declare. Um, we now have before us a recommended vote of the Board of Selectmen on the Complete Streets Program. Um, Mr. Renault, you ready? So, if you want to adopt the Complete Streets, please vote yes, number one. If you do not, vote two, no. And go ahead and vote. One hundred fifty seven the affirmative, thirty three in the negative. It is a positive vote, and I so declare it. We have a motion to adjourn. All in favor of adjourning, please vote yes. All in favor? Yes. No. No. Do we have any motions for reconsideration? Al Tosti has served motion for recon notice of reconsideration on Article twenty eight. What did you serve? Seven. Mr. Harris serves one on seven.